How does one adjust to life after being incarcerated? And are there enough programs to support those, support those who are making the transition? The new documentary, Veracity, Debt to Society, examines just that. Let's have a look. In the past six years, yeah, I didn't have a, a whole 12 months where I was out of jail. Can a life of crime. I killed my uncle in a vicious way be erased by a prison sentence. I'm not my criminal record. Those crimes and my conviction were well over 20 years old. What does it take for a convict I'm filming, you get to be crazy to become a contributing member of society? I've got to change my life, make some drastic decisions. Does a debt to society ever get paid in full? Does one mistake define the rest of your life? Some powerful stories heard there on life after lockup and digging into all of this. Our very own Christina Howren, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you for having me, Molly. You have had some unprecedented access uh, behind bars for the last decade. Uh, something the Canadian media doesn't necessarily get a chance to see. So first of all, thank you for taking us there. But in your process, what made you want to go beyond the walls and think about what happens after? Well, for over a decade, I've been covering what is happening behind bars, uh, what's happening behind the barbed wire. I've seen prisoners and inmates and convicts in all of these different situations. But I realized that even after all of my coverage over the past decade, I did not know what happened when convicts got out, when a convict becomes an ex-con. What type of steps are they taking to make sure that they are not going to reoffend, uh, that they're going to go back into communities and not create more victims? Because a lot of people don't know this, but in the next five years, most of the inmates that are serving time in our federal prisons will be released because most of their sentences are for five years less a day or five years or less. So we have a vested interest in finding out what happens when these individuals come out because if we want to have safer communities and be safe on our own streets, mm -hmm. We need the people that are getting incarcerated to come back with more than just being punished, but actually having some level of rehabilitation. So let's talk about some of the individuals you spoke with, and you really did a deep dive. Um, let's focus in on Troy. Tell us about him. So Troy Cryer is from, uh, I'll say, central Alberta. He is serving a 13-year sentence for manslaughter. He confessed to manslaughter, but he did kill his uncle, and he actually bludgeoned him to death with a baseball bat. Now, he is eligible for parole this month, but regardless, he is getting out in January. So we have a 38-year-old man who spent most of his adult life behind bars. He's a former gang member. He has six children. He is about to become a grandfather, but he's only 38 years old. Hmm. So he gets back in the community. What is that going to look like for him? Is he going to go back to, the, to his gang lifestyle? Is he going to go back to, create, uh, to creating chaos and committing heinous crimes? Or have there been enough programs and help along the way in our prisons to make sure that he has the skills necessary to get a job, that he can support himself and his massively big family, mm -hmm. and that he feels in a good enough place that he's not going to be committing crimes? Because we really have a vested interest in this. Let's talk about some of those programs that do exist, or maybe the ones that don't, uh, behind bars. What have you found? So there's a lot of employment programs, and a lot of that is inmates in our federal prisons, and a lot of people don't know this, they have to have a job or go to school unless they have like a, a medical condition. CORCAN, Corrections Canada, is a big company that works all across the prisons, and they actually give inmates skilled trades. So in some prisons, you're learning textile trades, in others, uh, like a Bowdoin, and Troy, for example, he's learning carpentry. And they leave there with the skills to actually become an apprentice, to get them out, and they have some work experience. They might not become a, you know, a red seal welder, but they certainly have enough experience to get a job in the real world. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that a lot of these job programs actually focus on soft skills. And I think of things like soft skills, like communication. Right. They're talking things like brushing your teeth, mm. showing up at work, showing up on time. Uh, not yelling at your manager, not yelling at your coworker. Very basic skills that I think that most of us would take for granted, but for a lot of these individuals, it's just stuff they were never taught right. or that they never actually learned or knew how to execute. 
Troy is just one of the individuals that you spoke with and, and, and did an investigation around on what their life is. Um, there is one woman who uh, you focused on in, in prison moms in a, in a previous yes. Uh, yes. piece that you've done, which was incredible. Uh, so go back and do watch that if you get a moment. And you followed her and her son, Charlie. So do tune in because I, I don't want to go too much into it because I want people to watch and see what her life has become There's after. Um, um, what has surprised you really doing all of this? It's not so much the programs, it's the individual's commitment. So in Troy's example, for example, he's already had day parole. He was released. He was living in a halfway house uh, in Edmonton. And he ran away. And that happens so often with so many inmates, uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, unfortunately more, more common with Indigenous, which is why uh, Correctional Services Canada has really started to make big investments in Indigenous programming. Mm -hmm. But he went in, he got into a halfway house, was there for several months, and then something snapped, and he went on a big drinking bender. Now, he was picked up within 24 hours, mm -hmm. but he wasn't ready to be back in society yet. Right. He says he is now ready. Uh, I know with one of our other contributors, Mike, he spent the past, past 10, 15 years in and out of jail and prison, and he would keep going back. He'd last for a couple of months and then end up going back, and now... We're in a situation where, and this is, it starts with this, so I'm not revealing anything, but he's actually a Red Seal certified welder, and he's living on a ranch, and it took him 15 years, or you know, 16 actually, back in and out and in and out, and lots of programming for him to finally, the light bulb yeah. to go off and him to say, no, I'm better than this, and I don't need to do this, and I'm going to be a better person. And now we watch him as he grows from a man who is living on the streets downtown to a guy that's learning how to be a cowboy. Wow. It's, it's really about the person more than just the programs, but the programs yes. are so important to give them that skills and to have that toolbox. Yeah, really incredible stories. Th this is just the tip of the iceberg, Christina. Uh, Veracity, Debt to Society premieres City TV, 10 o'clock Sunday night. Do tune in. Um, some incredible work that you're doing, Christina. Thank you so much for bringing your stories to, to us and your, all of the viewers. Well, thank you so much.